A few weeks ago, we initiated a series of panel interviews on racism and injustice, prompted by unrest and protest throughout the country after the death of George Floyd. Now again, this week, we witness the brazen shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, shot seven or eight times in front of three of his children, leaving him paralyzed. As we approach the beginning of the church year on September 1st, still very much in the pandemic crisis of COVID-19, it behooves us to consider a new start in our approach towards social injustice and inequity. Thank you for joining us in this initiative of the Department of Interorthodox, Ecumenical and Interfaith Relations of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. What I'd like to broach in this webinar is the issue of systemic or structural sin. What does it mean to speak truth? Because that is surely what confession or reconciliation is all about. And how does such reconciliation become part of our inner soul as well as of our collective conscience? Are we part of a community that is guilty of racism, whether or not we are individually culpable? How do we respond to, how do we reject this wrong? Are we perhaps more guilty than we think or imagine? Are we complicit when we are silent or indifferent? I am very grateful to be speaking with a couple of very special guests and friends. Metropolitan Alexander of Nigeria was born in Athens in 1960. He studied in the Department of Agriculture at the University of Athens and the School of Theology at the University of Thessaloniki. He was ordained as deacon and priest in 1997 for the metropolis of Johannesburg and Pretoria, where he served as presiding priest as well as secretary of the metropolis, becoming especially involved in its social ministries. He was elected as first bishop of the Diocese of Nigeria, Benin, Togo and Niger in 1997. He was elevated to the rank of Metropolitan in 2004. He is a member of various synodal committees of the Patriarchate of Alexandria and participated in the Holy and Great Council of Crete in 2016 as special advisor to Patriarch Theodore as well as for the press office of the council. Mother Catherine was raised Episcopal in downtown, downstate New York. Her spiritual journey brought her into contact with the Orthodox Church and especially the beauty of its icons and beauty and icons and music in the 1980s when she was baptized and tonsured a nun. She's been a nun for 32 years and the superior of St. Xenia Monastery in Indianapolis for most of that time. In the 1990s, she became active in the fight against present-day slavery and human trafficking, which led to a concern for the psychological trauma that persists even after securing freedom. So she earned a master's degree in counseling and launched a private counseling practice specializing in trauma-informed care. She is a founding member and current president of the Fellowship of St. Moses the Black, and she's authored four books including one on uh, racial reconciliation. Mother Catherine, today, August 28th, marks the feast of St. Moses the Black of Ethiopia, one of the fourth century great desert fathers. Perhaps this is a good point at the outset of this webinar for you to tell us a little bit about the brotherhood of St. Moses in this country. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I had a momentary distraction. So um, speak about the life of St. Moses and the inspiration for the fellowship. And the fellowship in particular, yes. Yes. So um, he began his life enslaved, um, did not take well to submitting to that life. So from his master's point of view, he was very unruly, was eventually let go became the head of a group of bandits and was renowned for terrorizing the region. And then visited a monastery. I don't know if he was looking for 
um, goods to steal or whatever, but God made use of that. Seeing the potential of his soul, he had a life-changing conversation with a spiritual elder there and remained as a monk and ended his life as a spiritual father and having as many monastic disciples as he had previously had um, bandits underneath him. Um, interviews with him are recorded in John Cashin's conferences, and so we have his uh, we have his wisdom to guide us today. So both the life of repentance, radical repentance, um, the possibility that God shows us that uh, no matter what our origins are, that we can be not only included in the church, but that we can shine as stars in the firmament of the saint, that, that no origin bars us from that. And we, we also have his monastic council. So all of that has been a real inspiration to us, as well as the fact that there was an apparition of St. Moses the Black to someone, I believe, in California, telling him that he was aware of the plight of African Americans and praying for us. Father, we can't hear you. I think you're muted. Thank you. Tell us about the foundation, the formation of the Brotherhood of St. Moses in this country. Yes, it started with um, an inspiration in 93 to have a conference where we just reflected on um, reflected on the Christian experience in Africa, the gifts of Africa to the Orthodox Church as a whole, especially through monasticism, and how that um, can be a blessing for African Americans today, learning about the saints, learning about their teachings, learning that there is an expression of the Christian church that has never been involved in slave, slave trade or trafficking of Africans. And so we had the conference and then the brotherhood sort of formed on the heels of that and has continued to host conferences every year in addition to other activities. That was when, sister, when did it first begin? 1993. 93. Mm -hmm. And are there members of the uh, Brotherhood? How does it work? Yes, um, there's the National Brotherhood and then there are local chapters. So um, if people have a local chapter near them, they can join a chapter or form a chapter. Um, that often begins now. We've had, of course, a lot of interest this summer. And so we've had people beginning with reading uh, race, identity, and reconciliation, and having discussions of it, um, saying the canon, we have a canon of racial reconciliation that's available on our website. So people will pray that, uh, the Kathis to St. Moses, the um, canon for racial reconciliation. And, um, oh, let me also say that today marks anniversary since 1963. August 28th was the day that Dr. Martin Luther King delivered his I Have a Dream speech at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. So what's been your experience in uh, this fight against social injustice? And also what's been your experience, sister, in the Orthodox Church and what you've seen there? Mm. Are you asking about my personal experience or about my insights from the reading and the reflection and all the other things? Both, both. Both. So my personal experience of systemic racism is fairly subtle because I have the advantage of coming from an educated family, uh, where I grew up, things like that. And so there are many things that um, 
I perhaps was not even aware of at the time. It was only until I began to study how it manifests that I was able to reflect and say, oh yes, there was something going on there beyond just the interpersonal conversation, something informing it. Right. And so I would say um, my, the dominant aspects of my experience are either people feeling that I don't fit their idea of place, of where a black woman should be placed in society or what she should be doing. I don't fit their idea of place or education or um, to accommodate for that, they will say, well, then I don't really see you as black. Mm -hmm. So I can either be black or I can be whatever they are that they're seeing that is admirable, but in order to do that, I have to stop being black. Have you seen any change, any progress, either since you became involved in um, issues of social justice or since you entered the Orthodox Church in the 80s? Well, when I entered, it was a very colorblind time. And so, uh, many people in the country weren't really thinking about race, were still um, thinking that the movement of the civil rights would be a steady progression forward, weren't realizing that maybe there would be a pendulum of experiences. So it was a very colorblind time. So I would say that the tension is uh, far more acute now than it was when I joined. Right, right. So, Your Eminence, if I turn to you, how does, from what you have heard or read about what's going on in America, uh, how does that relate to what has happened or is happening in Africa? What's your experience in the Orthodox communities uh, of Africa? And how do the Orthodox in Africa relate to or respond to social injustice? Yep. Um, as you said, I entered uh, the Patriarchate in um, 1988, officially, by becoming a priest for the Archdiocese of Johannesburg and Pretoria. 1988, South Africa, you understand the condition I met. It was the apartheid. apartheid um, right. A little bit tough in the beginning, before started, you know, going down and uh, finally abolished. So, um, for me, it was uh, quite uh, a shocking experience uh, living in South Africa among Greek communities. Eh? When I started seeing uh, the bosses, whites, non-whites, the benches in the parks, and all these type of things that you possibly read. But I saw it, I experienced it. And there it was the big uh, um, change in my life. And it was like a revelation. I mean, like John, I, I came to the island of Patmos and it was, you know, and it was uh, on the day of the Lord on Sunday. I mean, it was total, a total transformation through the experience that I had, and I was led even to, to the police station because the gardener of uh, the parish used to stay in a house attached to mine, which means that uh, we were violating the rules. So uh, I started from that experience. I lived, I experienced the, um, the fall of apartheid, the rising of uh, democracy and uh, freedom in, and the process of reconciliation in South Africa. And uh, then I found myself, by God's grace, as a bishop in Nigeria. And um, I think that uh, that experience of South Africa dealing with racism and etc. made me to bring out all the doubts that I already had, the doubts as a human being against, you know, racism, against the discriminations generally uh, about otherness, um, all those things that uh, here and there we used to read, I used to read. Um, then 
I came to realize uh, that the problem is um, was really systemic and uh, for us, and I will not be ashamed to say that is also for the patriarchate, uh, because we tolerated and we accepted um, this condition in South Africa starting from there. Yes, we may not be, we have never been involved as, as uh, Mother said, uh, in um, slavery, in trafficking and all these type of things, but in silence on the 19th century and etc., cetera, the um, Greek communities, let's be frank, and um, the, the church in most of the cases played, uh, remain silent, if not embraced, if not, and silence is more, more guilty than openly embracing for me, openly embracing a, a, a situation. Mm -hmm. So here we are in uh, Nigeria, in uh, among people who have, uh, and still, who have to deal, and I think still dealing with the post-colonial trauma, who is renewed by another uh, colonialism, neo-colonialism, you know, through the various uh, problematic systems, economic systems and uh, theories and philosophies that they promote the discriminations and racism because I personally feel that all these things are tied to economic systems. And so we'll come back to that in a moment, and I do want you to speak further to that. Um, I actually, as you were speaking, as you began, I thought, I wonder if I can press him a little further to talk about the patriarchate and the Greek communities, but you are who you are, your eminence, and that's why I admire you. You are very open, and um, you answered the question before I asked, and I'm very grateful. Uh, let's, let's continue with the same sort of issue then, and if I turn to you, Mother Catherine, um, you've actually written, you've said about systemic and structural racism. You've said that they are a system of control that you're born into and either benefit from or suffer from. So in the first instance, how does one become aware of this systemic or structural racism that's embedded in people's uh, hearts and in society? And secondly, I wonder, how do you overcome that, whether personally or in society? Mm -hmm. Well, becoming aware is not easy because we're, it's intended to work silently like a background program. So becoming aware isn't easy. We we internalize it in the same way that we internalize things about manners and um, social interactions. So we internalize um, the interactions between people groups the same way we internalize saying please and thank you or standing when um, elders come into the room or something like that. And so it feels as natural right. as manners. Um, even sometimes for the people that it works against. And going against it feels like you could say combing the hair the wrong way. It could even feel like going against conscience because even though it isn't a matter of right or wrong, those kind of injunctions seem to um, be formed in us right next door to conscience. Um, but what can help us is reflecting on a word that can describe our reality that's rarely associated in the United States, at least in the public discourse, with our racial experience, uh, but perhaps more so now because of a newly released book by Isabel Wilkerson called Cast, The Origin of Our Discontents. And what I've learned so far from reading her is that um, there have been systems of racial control in the US, caste in India, and in the Nazi quest for Aryan 
purity at the expense of the Jewish community, community and the Romani and others, these are normally, these are usually studied separately. She studied them together and compared them and came up with what she calls the eight pillars of caste. Caste being something that you're born into, um, It, it um, typically is based on um, an appeal to sacred texts or natural order to support the rightness of it. Um, certain tenets pertain to procreation, so concern for maintaining the purity of the blood of the upper caste. And we had in the United States all these laws against uh, intermarriage between people of European descent and others, um, concern for maintaining, uh, for only marrying within that and the heritability of caste. So you're born into it. It's not like class where you can move out of it through education or occupation or something right. like that. Caste you're born into and you remain into. So these two things interact, caste and class interact if you accept that paradigm. Uh, the pillars also include the dehumanization of the lowest caste, the consignment of the lowest caste to menial and undesirable labor, which may or may not be um, paid at all, and the acceptance of the use of violence to maintain the caste order. Now, the dehumanization and the violence work hand in hand because by dehumanizing the lowest caste, violence against it is somehow not seen as violence in the narrative of the dominant caste. Thank you, thank you. Um, we're very fortunate to have with us Father Nathaniel Johnson now, who's uh, joined us. We had some technical difficulties and we had the, the calendar of the Orthodox Church. Um, it's the Dormition Feast in the old calendar today. Uh, so both he and uh, Mother Catherine have been celebrating the Dormition Feast today. Um, just as in the new calendar, it's the Feast of St. Moses. So Father Nathaniel, welcome. For the benefit of those listening, Father Nathaniel served the Orthodox Church as a deacon in the San Lorenzo Valley for 28 years, and for the last five years has been assistant priest at the St. Lawrence Church in Fen Felton, California. There, um, he and his presidera Susan have three children. The eldest is an Orthodox nun, in fact, at the St. John the Forerunner Monastery in Goldendale, Washington. Father Nathaniel was raised in a black Baptist church from birth. He converted to Orthodoxy in the 1980s. He's an accomplished musician, a retired engineer, and he enjoys wood carving and has even designed and built a wooden boat that I'd certainly like to see. Father Nathaniel, welcome. And before we start uh, with you on the questions of this webinar, um, I wish you our condolences uh, for those who've lost their lives in the fires in California and all strength that's needed to overcome them. Tell us a little bit about how things are going there in your region. You're right in the, the heart of it. Well, uh, uh, forgive me for being late. Um, we uh, have uh, a couple of parish parishioners who have lost their homes, burnt to the ground. Um, all of us have been evacuated from the communities. And so we're all staying with other people. And um, fortunately, uh, as a church, we've been doing services anyway. We've been doing services. Uh, today's uh, Domitian uh, Divine Liturgy was done at a parishioner's uh, patio uh, outdoors. So um, in, in honor of honoring and praising God, no matter what the conditions are, that's the, the stance that we're taking. Uh, so by God's grace, we're all in, in good health. We're uh, uh, doing our best to uh, encourage one another so that we don't uh, become gloomy and, and concerned or worried. Um, and so far, things are going very well. 
Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, our prayers are with you, Father, and our thoughts. And I know that uh, our Archbishop, His Eminence Elipido Boros, has sent a personal message to Metropolitan Gerasimus. And I know that people all over America are following, you know, the movement and the controlling and the loss uh, through the fires um, on a day-to-day -day sort of uh, level. So, um, let me ask you, you said that you talked about gloom. There's a lot going on in America right now, whether we're talking about the fires, whether we're talking about COVID, or whether we're talking about um, the divisiveness in, in our society, the political and sort of cultural, social unrest. Um, today marks several, you know, anniversaries. We talked about Martin Luther King's speech. We talked about uh, St. Moses uh, Day and the Feast of the Dormition. It's also like today, 1955, that 14-year-old Emmett Till was lynched in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering what you think about how far we've come as a society 60, 70 years later. And how far do you think we've come as an Orthodox Church in this time? Uh, first of all, uh, one thing that I haven't uh, revealed is that I had the opportunity to, to sit uh, and talk with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King for 45 minutes. Uh, he ap happened to walk into a restaurant where I was playing uh, music. Um, and so we talked about uh, conditions. This was just uh, maybe a year before he was assassinated. Um, I have said to many people that uh, because of our conversation, uh, I I've strongly feel that Martin Luther King would be crying some very sorrowful tears because we have gone backwards rather than forwards from that time period um, in, in, in some ways, not, not totally. Um, so as a, as a, as a uh, society, unfortunately, discrimination still exists um, in, a, in, a, in a very subtle way. But unfortunately, since this pandemic, um, somehow people feel uh, privileged to show who they really are. Right. And our situation right now as Orthodox Christians, first of all, God does not bring evil, but he allows certain things to exist in our lives to bring us spiritually to the next level. Um, and we're not all on the same level. But in this case, it's a pandemic that is worldwide. And therefore, um, I have said to my parishioners that approach me, God has given us an exam. And so we have an opportunity to pass or fail. Um, not, in, not in a sense of, of, of the outcome, fail in terms of knowing where we really are, who we really are as Orthodox Christians. First of all, the, because this is so uh, global, um, no matter what our stance or our position in life, no matter what our titles are, priest, layman, whoever, whatever your title is, we are all being tested in knowing how much do we really truly believe in God and trust God. And therefore, if we do, um, and this is, what, this is the answer uh, that I have, if we do, then we should not be sad. We should not be worried. We should know that God is always with us, uh, but he cares enough for us that he wants us to not stay in one spot uh, spiritually, but to move and, and closer and closer to the kingdom. We will not leave this earth until God truly thinks we're ready. And in most cases, including in mine, uh, 
God's not called me yet. I'm still serving him and his people. At my age, I'm supposed to be retired, which I don't believe you can retire from God. Uh, so I'm serving. Uh, and much to everyone's surprise in my, my parish, um, you know, most people my age are just come and participate a part partial, you know, uh, at a little time, only when it's a need. I'm almost full time. I don't believe in sitting back. So because of all that I have said, uh, uh, the pandemic has created a, a certain situation. The fires have created a certain situation. Um, and as far as discrimination is concerned, those who really, we're in, we're in a state of being where you can't hide anymore. Right. Who you really are right. is what people are seeing. I often say that the, the word crisis, we need to remember, literally means judgment. And that means that we are being judged on what's happening, on what we're witnessing and so forth. And right. Before I move on, I need to say, because you apologized and there was no need to, for being late, uh, you're not even in your house, are you? You're elsewhere. No, That's correct. You're being, you're being hosted by friends. You've had to move away from your home and your church. So thank you so much for joining us, Father. Your Eminence, I wonder if I can turn to you and go back to this notion that you touched on and that uh, Mother Catherine also spoke of, um, the notion of systemic and structural racism. Um, I'm wondering, what you can add here from your experience in Nigeria or in Africa more broadly, um, how can someone, you learned from what you saw in African apartheid, how can someone become aware of this systemic racism and how can someone work to overcome it? What sort of things have you learned? I've come to believe that um, the only thing that we have to fight for and fight against is the theological illiteracy. Well, I believe that this is the root. I'm talking as an Orthodox uh, Christian, as an Orthodox uh, clergyman, as a bishop, as a member of the Synod. I am sad to say that, but there is uh, not only within us, I mean, in the continent, but uh, in most of the Orthodox churches, uh, we find a huge, I mean, an unacceptable theological um, illiteracy. Uh, there are so many biblical, they are talk about how the kingdom is really, um, is really revealed and what I mean uh, God is asking of all of us how we expected to live all together eh? that uh, there is no discriminations that diversity is uh, a blessing and uh, a confirmation of the Trinitarian existence so all these type of things and we come here to see that neither the clergy when the clergy we when we ourselves are not educated or we are consumed by our ethnic and cultural prejudices and demands, mm -hmm. then I think that the condition will remain the same. I always believe that, uh, I think we have discussed in the past, uh, um, and I always believe that we are suffering from identity crisis. We have an identity problem. And what do I mean by that? I mean that most of us, and I start from the clergy, bishops or going down to everybody, we do not want to realize that we um, take um, our identity, we derive, our identity derives from the escatha, from the kingdom, from the things to come, and all the other identities, ethnic, um, racial, whatever, whatever, you name it, come after. So, let us fight, and this is my uh, position, I've said it many times in the Synod, don't ask me what has, has, has happened because I will, 
I, I will sound nasty again to my to my superiors and uh, unfortunately nothing has been done but we mm. cannot do anything in Africa if we don't start from there if we don't start educating ourselves first of all and I will I will be categorically state that if one has to be educated primarily is the members of the synod right. sorry for saying that no, that's very and then very started very going down mm -hmm. to fight because when you talk about discrimination we don't have only a discrimination based on uh, on the race we have discrimination based on gender something that is very much prevailing in in africa okay who will speak out to, uh, for the voiceless uh, widows, for example, for the kids that the female kids that they are forced to female mutilation? Who is going to to speak about um, um, the HIV carriers? Who is going to sp to speak about? I will tell you, uh, people with special uh, abilities. Uh, who is going to speak about the albinos? All those that are stigmatized. Right. Africa is full of stigma. And unfortunately, I have to say that they know that uh, I am far, far, far from being, uh, God forbid, racist or whatever, but I, or uh, against any culture, on the contrary, but I believe that we all have to realize, despite our um, background, our ethnic or racial background, that automatically no culture is holy. Okay, there are elements in the culture that they bring the order of death. And these elements, I strongly feel that they have to be uprooted. So the question that arises many times is, what are we doing in Africa? Do we really enflesh the gospel in the various cultures or we allow the cultures to, to lead the gospel where they want? Right. So you're in a huge problem, this one. I mean, you're talking about education, ultimately, um, mm -hmm. uh, because neither bishops nor clergy are sort of hatched from eggs. They uh, go through seminaries. Every one of your clergy mm -hmm. and every one of our clergy here in the United States go mm -hmm. through a seminary. So I'm wondering that you, then you talk about the gospel principles, that ultimately that's what it's all about. What is the role of seminaries, in your opinion, and in Athens or Thessaloniki or here at Holy Cross uh, or St. Vladimir's? Just how much connection is made be between scripture and applied scripture, between doctrine and applied doctrine? I will start with a comment that I've never stepped my, my foot in the States in my life, so I don't know what is happening in Holy Cross in, uh, or in other seminaries. So I, it would be very unfair for me and uh, okay. uh, uh, not proper at all to, to That's talk. Fair but I will, say, I will say that one thing, that in Africa that I know and I'm entitled to speak, unfortunately, we have imported Western uh, systems of education. Right. Right. Western systems of education. And this is not what we really need. Right. For me, the two theological academies that we have, the English uh, Anglophone in uh, Nairobi and the Francophone in uh, Kinshasa, they both need total rehabilitation. Right. Because you cannot work in Africa with a curricula of a Western uh, an American, no matter how beautiful work maybe your seminaries are doing, but they do not have, they, do, they cannot offer what we really need at this point. And what we need in, is not a Western-based, uh, and sorry for that, but this is a reality, a Western-based theology. We need to rediscover as African church what are the holies that like as an apostle Paul found in Athens, eh? right. the holy place, he says to the Athenians, to find which, which is the theology, the logos about the divine in the African cultures, which, um, and all these things, all these things are the, um, the, 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 uh, the path that they will lead us in, in incarnating the gospel into the continent as it's supposed to be. And this is not happening. So 
taught education, rehabilitation of the systems, sorry mm -hmm. for saying that, and um, um, uh, we have really to study well, mm, to study well the doctrine of incarnation, to realize mm -hmm. what incarnation means and what it means to incarnate the gospel in the context of this particular moment. So Thank my... You. Whatever you find proper in the States or they find proper in Greece to teach and include in the seminaries, and we have copied and, do, and teach in our own seminaries, they are good, not bad, but it's not everything. Today, if you want to, to discuss in Africa, you have to discuss about justice. You have to discuss about economy. You have to discuss about environment. You have to discuss about uh racism as well yes you have to to discuss about healing the broken lives of millions of people and here comes and starts another question that um, is the christology our christology as we know it is it the christology that can be really adapted and speak to the african church of today let me tell you i don't want to keep more time from your, uh, the other guests is not fair, but I will tell you something. The church in Africa is not simply a dancing church, okay? What I mean by that is not simply a church that knows how to dance, you know, uses, I mean, don't think all of you particular elements, elements of our divine liturgy and etc. It's something more deep. And if the patriarchate at this moment wishes to go forward, eh? should have done it before, we are late. It's supposed to educate, you know, no matter what the needs are, our social work is needed, but can never be the priority. The priority should be the people that bear the work and the load of mission. And these are the priests in the late uh, in the last village of the african continent we have to take care of him educate him because it's not me neither you nor the patriarch nor any bishop despite uh, the, the color to who is uh, doing the mission thank you that's really helpful i wonder if i can turn to our other panelists then to mother catherine first and then also father nathaniel uh, to ask from your experience in the Orthodox Church, based on what His Eminence is saying, what do you think the Orthodox Church has to offer in this respect? And more especially, I would say, what do you think the Orthodox Church needs to learn about the way it approaches um, uh, issues of uh, racism or inequality? Mother Catherine, you first. All right. So... I have to speak to the situation in the United States, although I was blessed to visit Nigeria um, in the 1970s. I had a wonderful, wonderful visit and stayed at the University of Ife with my father, who had been invited to give a series of lectures on Africa and the diaspora. So I had a wonderful visit and everyone treated me as if I were their personal guest. The hospitality there is just amazing. Um, so I would say ethnic Orthodox in America have an advantage because they, even though they're in the matrix of this system of caste, if we accept that paradigm, and I think there are compelling reasons to entertain it, uh, you exist in that matrix, but uh, it's not it's not in your DNA in the same way as um, kind of the original white people of the United States. So I think it's easier for you to see through it. I think it's easier for you to read without feeling threatened by educating yourselves. And um, and then an important work is um, enough people in the parish educating themselves so that when African-Americans 
feel moved to visit an Orthodox church, learn about the riches of the sacraments, of the fact that um, in spite of the fact that there are things to improve, it never was involved in the direct slave trade or oppression of Africans, uh, that they'll feel welcome, that they'll feel understood. Right. That they won't be asked why they're there or wouldn't they feel more comfortable in the Ethiopian church or things that some people have heard over, over the years. Um, especially the Greek people who um, can, some at least can remember what it was like to be reckoned as non-white in the United States, to be indentured workers, to be targets of the KKK, and then over times to have the tent flaps of whiteness opened, to be welcomed in, to gain access to certain blessings of society and certain unspoken rules, um, one of which is you're never to make the original white people uncomfortable about race, um, meaning going along with ethnic jokes, uh, perhaps being invited to adopt a condescending attitude toward blacks. Um, but I think it's easier for you to see through it. It's easier for you to, um, your identity isn't based in upholding it. Your, your sense of self is not based in it. Your sense of self is hopefully based in being children of God and first and Greek second. So what can you do when you see a dominant, when you see dominant caste brutality against a black man, and I'm not gonna say police brutality because that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's just the tip of the iceberg. When you see dominant caste brutality against a black man, please don't rush to say, but he had a criminal record. Okay. Because that's part of the legacy of making the undercast. Uh, the deliberate criminalization of his life. So keep him in his customary neighborhoods. Redlining is no longer legal, but the effects of it are entrenched. See to it that he has no access to decent schools by basing school funding on local property tax. That's not the only way school funding could happen. But it keeps the urban schools poor remove most gainful employment from his neighborhoods to the suburbs or even overseas. And then when he resorts to surviving by an alternate alternative economy, which is what a person has to do if they're going to eat, uh, make that illegal. Then impose the stiffest penalties. And of course he may have a criminal record, but don't say that as if that was his essence because it's part of the system and it's intentional. Like the story of Abba Moses. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And um, so part of the caste system is to always find ways to blame the undercaste for deserving their lot and, to, and that reinforces the quote unquote moral purity of the upper caste, but that moral purity has nothing to do with the actual biblical virtue as we understand it in the Orthodox Church. Great, thanks. So, uh, Father Nathaniel, I wonder if I can ask the same question of you, from your experience, uh, based on all that the Metropolitan and Mother Catherine have said. What do you think the Orthodox Church still needs to learn? What do you think the Orthodox Church has to offer? And in particular, I mean, if Mother Catherine mentioned that she was attracted to the beauty of the, the music and the icons. How does Orthodox liturgy fit on, into all of this? How does Orthodox spirituality make sense of all of this? So, uh, as I listened to His Eminence uh, explaining situations that are in Africa, I think, I think uh, from uh, personally that we are uh, unconsciously making a mistake just focusing on the African-American. I think that we should be talking about all the ethnic groups and especially when you talk about America, what's lacking in America is that 
first of all, you walk into an Orthodox church and you don't see multiple ethnic groups in the iconography. Hmm. And so because of that, there's a lack of associating yourself with someone. For, for example, in our church, we only have, we have a, a St. Moses and we have um, uh, the uh, 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 St. Olga, who's an Alaskan. There should be more of that type. We should have some, we should have Oriental, right. we should have Chicano, we should have all these different groups that represents the American society. And I think I, you know, the, you know, the, I've been involved in conversations about get how, how can we get the African American into the Orthodox Church? Well, when he comes into the church, um, for example, St. Moses is, the icon is in the back of the church. It's not up in the front. Um, so the, the, I think the Orthodox Church, what it needs to learn is first of all to take a real close look at the makeup of ethnic groups in America and the church should reflect that. I think it's a huge topic and a, a vital topic. I've often thought about the way we canonize saints or um, uh, welcome saints into the you know, hagiologion of our church, that it should be reflective of the local, first of all, the time, and also the local culture. We seem to promote saints that are of sort of one particular strand of spirituality and whatever, mostly men, mostly long bearded men, mostly exactly. ordained men. And you're saying widen that scope up. And I think you're spot on. Yes. Yeah, I, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to, for example, my family, when I became an Orthodox Christian, the first thing you wanted to know why, and the, 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 the why question is what the Orthodox Church has to offer. Hmm. The, the Orthodox Church can trace its beginnings all the way back to, the, to Christ himself and his apostles. And so when you and I, and even the Metropolitan, when we were ordained, we had hands laid on us. The same hands that were laid on us, and Mother Catherine too, the same hands that were laid on us were the hands of Christ when he laid them on his apostles, and his apostles in turn went out uh, to do what Christ asked them to do, had to go out and evangelize uh, and expose the, the kingdom of God, and they created bishops and priests, and they laid hands on them. That's apostolic succession. All of us, male and female, have received apostolic succession. That, you cannot point at any other denomination and see that. They all came from us. <laughs> You know, the first, the first church split was the Western Orthodox Church from the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church was on the West. Um, so I think, I think the Orthodox Church has to emphasize this apostolic succession so that all groups, everyone that we approach, uh, understands the continuity of orthodoxy from the from its beginnings it comes from the church that was waiting as christ asked him to wait until the comforter came that was the first church um and so we need to emphasize that and, and teach that as 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 uh orthodox not to go out and beat people on the head with the bible like the presbyterian but to just to just to educate as Metropolitan was saying uh, about Africa, we have to educate the United States as well. Um, we have tradition. 
we are, are the way we do divine liturgy, our services is not made up by us. It, it's a tradition that carries all the way back to the original church. It's history. We should be talking about its history. So going back to what have I learned uh, from the church or what, what does the church need to learn? I think it needs to learn that its identity is not very clear yet. Mm. Because when you look at, uh, Mother Catherine mentioned uh, the, uh, the Greek church. I can remember as a, as a new, new, newly ordained priest going to a, a, a church, Greek church, and feeling like an outcast. Uh, pr practically ignored. Um, Your experience. Yes. This is my personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, they, the, just to give you an example, we, the, the service a meal. All the clergy were having a meeting there. Um, and the women came out with a meal, the plates. My plate was the last one that came out. In my eyes, that was no accident. Hmm. It, it was the way things were done. Um, so that kind of thing has to be acknowledged, right. learned, and taught to the people that, you know, you're, first of all, we're in America. And all of us. That, that's something for people to learn, actually. That, yeah. That, don't take we're that in for America. Granted. And all of us should be uh acknowledged as americans right. we need to get away from skin color mm. again we need to get away from discrimination at least it should not be in the church thank you father thank you um before we close i'd like i want to turn to the metropolitan but before we do that uh, mother catherine you mentioned uh, police brutality and i wonder if there's something you can tell us positive or at least uh, constructive, inspiring, um, help us to make sense of uh, the things that we're seeing in America today, the, the division that I referred to earlier with the police brutality, with the Black Lives Matter protests, with the mm -hmm. militia violence, with the cancel culture and the, the politicization of all of this. Um, how do we make sense of it? as Orthodox Christians? I don't know that this is an Orthodox uh, angle on it, but a starting point for me is just to say the country has always been violent, mm -hmm. always. Violence takes different forms, sometimes as overt as the gun, sometimes as subtle as the plate coming out last but the country has always been violent and it's thanks to the systemic, the systematic dehumanization of the black undercaste that the upper caste performs a certain sleight of hand or sleight of mind, if you can call it that, where violence against blacks somehow doesn't count as violence in the dom dominant caste story of America. It's not interpersonal violence if the black isn't fully a person. So any impugning of the original sin of racism is met with pushback. Um, sometimes very intense pushback. Um, and labeling uh, my attempt to tell American history so that the voice of my people is heard or any other marginalized group that history gets labeled as liberal or communist or un-American or something like that. Um, but what I did learn uh, from Isabel Wilkerson in her book that I mentioned at the beginning of CAST is that when the Nazis wished to create their own um, ready-made caste system, they studied the American treatment of blacks to figure out how they were gonna then treat the Jews and the Romani 
or gypsies. They had um, a closed door meeting of some 17 people discussing how to uh, incorporate uh, how the US was doing things. And to our shame, they sometimes found us too harsh. Uh. So we're used to sitting here pointing our fingers to Nazi Germany saying, how on earth could they? They studied us and they said some of what we did here was too harsh. They couldn't go that far. An example being um, the state codes that said one drop of black blood made you a member of the lowest caste. They weren't willing to do that. They saw Aryan blood as more purifying. So if a person had a certain amount of Aryan blood, even if they were part Jewish, they were considered Aryans. So they wouldn't go with that one drop rule. And there are other things that um, are really too painful to talk about no, that you. I will just pass over in silence. But they did learn from us. So we've always been violent. Other people have been able to see it. And we have, by some sleight of hand, told a story of a pristine origin of the country that is bound up with the uh, appropriation of the Christian story to justify slavery. There's nothing in Christianity that's culpable. Again, had the first American settlers been Jewish or Hindu or anything else, those texts would have been appropriated. There's nothing problematic with Christianity. It just was the faith of those who came. So that isn't really good news, I'm sorry. But it is news that things are becoming more overt. Right. No, but being aware of the history is, I think, just putting things in context. Yeah. More, you know. Right. So police, so police are enforcing caste. When they feel like and it's not just black men, but black men in particular are targeted more than black women when they feel that they're stepping out of place, um, not showing due reverence for the dominant caste in the person of the law enforcement or whatever it is, then they use violence to put people in their place and to make an example of them as has been happening for hundreds of years. Thank you. The, the police profession, and they teach this in police academies, I'm not making this up, uh, teaches that one of the origins of policing is in catching escaped slaves. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Well, I didn't know so, that. It makes sense, yeah. There's no, there's no surprise that there's that tension there. That's right. So, Your Eminence, um, how can you, we've touched on many issues here, how can we sort of pull some of these strands together? What final remarks do you have um, for our discussion? Uh, final remarks. Um, I'm very, um, um, very happy from what I heard from uh, Mother Catherine and uh, Father Nathaniel. You know, uh, I would like to say to Mother Catherine that uh, she visited Nigeria 50 years ago. She can come now and let's put hands together with your uh, office as a mother superior, Father Nathaniel can join us, and let's see what, if we can set up a monastic uh, brotherhood or sisterhood here. And let's see the days like that, let's call it St. Moses or Virgin Mary or both, whatever. Uh, the invitation is open and I do mean it. Be rest assured that uh, all the clergy around and all the people, all the clergy are Nigerians. There is no other uh, except uh, me that is not Nigerian. 99.9% uh, of the flock are Nigerians. So they will be extremely happy seeing uh, brothers and sisters coming from the States uh, sharing the faith. I want to close with uh, my com repeating what I said earlier. We have to focus on education. We have to create tra uh, transformed faith communities. 
these communities will be able in the years to come to fight from within racism, at least within the, uh, the, the territory of, uh, of the church, which is uh, totally unacce unacceptable. Um, and then the structures we may change. And we have to start not only educating the members, we have to, to, to look in the education also of the very young and uh, tender ages from nursery school, from primary school. There we allow the kids to get used to racism and discrimination. They see somebody different in color, in gender, whatever, whatever it may be. Uh, they will start mocking, they will start laughing for maybe for a kid, for a person that I said he has special abilities or uh, with uh, an albino or with this or with that. All this we have to uproot it. Then as church, except all these things we can do, we have two powerful texts, except the Bible itself that is our leading. We have recent tests. We have the synodical text on mission, test, uh, text on mission of the church in Crete 2016 that speaks volume about the human rights, about racism, about all the social and moral issues and the, the presence of the Orthodox Church in the world. And finally, we have something that you people in the Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Church of America, you did, and it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic work for the life of the world, the seventh chapter on the human rights. I was reading it earlier before coming, and I said that these are tools in our hands. The Bible is a tool. The history, as Father Nathaniel insisted, is a tool in our hands. So we, all, we have to use all that, and we will be very happy if we see uh, the racism and all this ugly situation as we read and as it was described today by your host to be at least, at least reduced if not eliminated immediately and also the other forms of racism for our uh, flock and not only a flock for the residents and the inhabitants of this uh, our continent which is the mother of con mother of uh, all the nations and all the races thank you very very much for your invitation mother father it was a pleasure meeting you so your eminence metropolitan alexander mother catherine weston and father nathaniel johnson thank you so so much for uh sharing your time uh, sharing your experience sharing your thoughts with us and i hope this is a new beginning his eminence has already built the next steps here but i hope that we can begin a, a, a larger conversation about these issues in our church and my thanks to all of you for watching and listening